Coming up on Motor Driven this week, it's go, go, go for the Kyle Army 9 hour. We count down to next week's big race. Kia bolstered their Seltos lineup with a super frugal diesel. Is it the pick of the bunch? And it's a proudly South African moment as we catch up with Sheldon van der Linde. Welcome to our first episode of Motor Driven. I think the name pretty much says it all. Straight talking about all things motoring, past, present and future. We're not here to recreate the wheel, just have as much fun as possible with it and obviously give you honest opinion. This is ours, we're all allowed one. In terms of format, because we are online, it allows us to be super flexible. But usually we're going to bring you the latest news. There will always be a feature car that we will review. And then we'll end off with, well, pretty much anything that excites us. Like this week, we catch up with DTM superstar Sheldon van der Linde. I, I personally can't wait to get back to South Africa again. It's been a year since I've been there and since we last chatted. So let's get off the start line with the Kyle Army 9 Hour, an event that I had the privilege of working on last year. Now with the chaos that has been 2020, it nearly didn't get the green light. But boy, are we relieved that it did. Twenty-eight of the greatest GT teams, the world's best GT drivers, are here in South Africa to contest the final round of the Intercontinental GT Challenge, which is powered by Pirelli. Hello, what you must massacre? So you said. Got there. Yes. yes. There we go, man. Ready to go. Great. I'm Raffaele Marcello from Italy. I'm racing with Group M and with a Mercedes MG GT3. This track is a little bit narrow and you know that concrete wall is very close. So if I take mistakes, sorry, yeah. sorry. <laughs> but, but I think the car is very strong. It doesn't matter. Hey everybody, it's Carl von Linde here. I'm 23 years old from South Africa and I'm driving for Audi Sport Team WRT car number 25. Hello guys, I am Bertrand Baguette. I come from Belgium. I am racing for Honda Team Motul with this uh, beautiful uh, NSX uh, GT3 and uh, very happy to be here. Hi, I'm Jordan Pepper, I'm South African and I drive for Bentley Team M Sport. Hi, I'm Mario Engel, racing for Mercedes AMG Team Group M, car number 999. Hi guys, I'm Sheldon van Linde, driving the number 42 BMW Team Schnitzer GD3 at the Kyle Army 9 hour. Well, my first race in South Africa was at this venue in 1973, driving alongside Aidan Schechter, I think it was the Gunston sponsored Chevron B26. The return of international sports car racing to South Africa is about to get underway. The lights go green. The Kyle Army 9R is underway. Who makes the best start? The Porsche just noses ahead then as they dive down towards the king. Maxi Boogie evaporated on the opening lap, a car out with a damaged cylinder coil off the road. Chris Goodwin on only the third lap of the race, he rattled through the gravel over the kerb, did lots of damage, the clutch needed changing, the underside needed repairing, and they lost well over 80 laps. Minister Mbagile Valula, well done, how are you today? I'm good, 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 and uh, good to be here, and thanks for having me. Joining me is the MEC for Sports, Arts and Recreation, um, Mbali Klobe, how are you? Amazing. Listen, this is a great event for Gauteng. Well, I tell you what, great to have you. Looking forward to your Thank set you, later. Fantastic. I love meeting fellow petrolheads. Let's man. catch up with the race action live. And the first full course yellow and safety car period was not far away because off the track bounced the Lamborghini in the hands of Darby Hubert. As then, Andy Suchek had a tyre exploded and it took a load of bodywork with it then the rain did come and boy how it fell the circuit was waterlogged we had a full course yellow with the 108 Bentley off the road just as the rain fell and it meant that it was a very long safety car period of well over an hour but eventually Alan Adon the race director was proved right to keep the race going because the rain stopped and the race was allowed to get back underway with about half an hour just under to go and it meant that all bets were off. The Fricadelli car took over the lead, a race win for Mathieu Jaminet, Dennis Olsen and Nick Tandy, a championship win for Dennis Olsen and a manufacturer's crown for Porsche as well at the end of an all-action 
Kyle Army. Nine hour, the return of a legendary sports car race. That's the Aston Martin, the Castrol car going wide at Hell Corner for the first time. It's a stunning sunrise on the mountain, but there was always early drama. Into the wall goes the Garage 59 car. Up in a barbecue goes the Mark car's entry. And Warren Luff got away with that one. That car would later return. One of the big high profile exits in this was Garth Tander in car 22. Just one of those Bathurst things. GT was OK. We had all kinds of weather around us, lightning. But the thunder belongs to the guys from Crew and from M Sport as Bentley wins on the mountain. The Empire strikes back for the British brand. And Jules Goudon is remarkably happy. and we are racing look at the rain and the american flag flies as the rain starts to pick up significantly oh boy this is going to be fascinating down into turn one i don't think it's going to rain for long so right. i anticipate these drivers being back in maybe in the next 15 20 minutes the radar shows a very brief period of rain it is heavier than we anticipated look at those conditions of this rain cal this is uh, something that no one anticipated no. because the deluge right now is almost going to get to the point that they may lose the racetrack in terms of keeping it safe. Well, the bigger concern, uh, concern here is, is if that tire now comes apart and starts flailing and it rips up bodywork, and it's tough. You've been going so fast for so long to just really slow it down. And there's yeah. something's oh. wrong with this car. Oh! Right rear. You could see it grabbing yeah. down the straightaway as oh, that was just trying to feel it out. So. Uh, right rear, right rear, yeah, look at that. Broken. BMW winning the inaugural eight hours. The Indianapolis eight hours in an absolutely superb run with uh, Vulcan Horse Motorsports. A sweep by BMW of both of the categories here in the inaugural Indianapolis eight hour. Look at that celebration down at the wall. Well deserved indeed. Uh, what a remarkable run it has been for BMW and for Nikki Katzberg. A win at the Nürburgring and now a win here at Indianapolis for BMW, Nikki. Here we go. The 2020 Total 24 Hours of Spa is about to get underway. Mercedes Audi on the front row of the grid. CW Moses from AWS shows the flag. We go racing. Raffaele Marchiello is in the lead, but is he going to hang on to it? Yes, he is. And they power uphill. You're on board with Ricard Leitz, and he's the one now right up with Mara Engel, who's finding himself dropping down the order, not gaining places. Kelvin van der Linde, that is perhaps the most significant stop yet. Kelvin van der Linde, who was fighting 45 minutes ago for the race lead is parked and that to me says retirement that's one of the big name Audis out of the race the Aston a massive spin for the Aston yeah. the Porsche managers get around that then I mean we've seen this happen before at Radio on a car well, look at the look at the bodywork. I mean, there's so much yeah. debris in the racetrack. The Audi accelerates away now, so Fred Verbeek is going to be up the hill in the lead, but he won't stay there because there goes the Ferrari. New race leader at Spa, 51, takes over the advantage. The nice warm tyres. Alessandro Pierre Guidi is the race leader. Side by side, past the endurance pits on lap 522. Up the kerb goes the Ferrari. Porsche goes through. Matteo Cairoli goes third. Brave, brave stuff. The 2020 Total 24 Hours of Spa is about to be won by Rover Racing, by Porsche, by Albamba, by Lawrence Van Thor, and by Nick Tandy, who takes the check flag. Checkered flag, checkered flag. The Porsche just held together as the fantastic winner's trophy is held aloft. And what a drive, what a result, and what a way to end a race that was absolutely full of surprises, full of drama. And as was the case at last year's Kailami 9 hour, the championship will be decided at this round. There are 25 points up for grabs, 
and we have eight drivers separated by just three points. Most exciting for us, of course, is that South African Jordan Pepper is in with a shout to clinch the championship at his home race. How amazing would that be? Sadly, as has been the case this year with COVID, there are no spectators allowed at this year's race, but that doesn't mean you're going to miss out on the action. As with last year, all of the pre-race and race coverage will be coming to you live on Supersport, so don't miss out on that. There is so much choice in the crossover SUV segment. How do you know what to choose? Perhaps you like loyalty to a particular brand. Is it how it looks and its image? But if it is efficiency that you're after, I think Kia could have just the perfect product for you. It may have slid in under the radar when it arrived last year, but the Kia Seltos is not a car that you should overlook, as I discovered in February when I drove the range-topping GT line. Then there is the car that we are driving, and this is the debut of their all-new 1.4-litre TGDI, or Kappa engine that they like to call it. It's also linked to a reworked, improved 7-speed DCT transmission. That engine is exclusive to uh, the GT line in the Seltos. So overall for me, the ride quality and refinement is really top notch. Now at the time, Kia committed to bringing a diesel variant to the lineup mid-year, and that would slot in between the entry-level 1.6 litre naturally aspirated engine and the range topping 1.4 litre turbo. And guess what? It is here, which is no small miracle considering what the world has gone through the last couple of months. What do you guys think? I actually quite like it. There's no fussy swooping lines, but rather bold and clean ones. Like this shoulder line, it really emphasizes the wheel arches. And when you view it from behind, those bolstered flanks and that tucked in glass house really emphasizes the width of the Seltos. The chrome detailing linking the tail lights also helps with that. Now where the GT line felt a little overstyled with every detail embellished in chrome, this suits me a lot better. The two-tone created with the darker cladding is a little lost with this color. I think it's going to look really striking in white. The C pillar has become a real focal point for designers these days and Kia have turned up. Or is that upturned? What is quite cool for me is how that shoulder line at the rear suddenly reappears here at the front flanks and it plays a really crucial role in the strong front end styling on the Seltos. It links up the front headlights and have a look at this detailing on the bonnet. It's got a clamshell effect. The tiger nose that Kia is well known for has just been reimagined. Lighting in layers seems to be a Korean trend and with the chrome touches you have a front end you're not going to miss but hey it may be a chiseled face not to everyone's liking. But what is really great with Kia is the standard specification. What you see here is the entry-level EX derivative. There's no need to tick any option boxes. You get auto headlights with LED daytime running lights, the fog lamps, the silver finishing on the front faux scuff plate, as well as the diffuser, electric mirrors with integrated indicators, 16-inch alloys with a full-size spare wheel, which is great. The roof rails also finished in silver, and I love how they've treated the end detailing of the rails. Integrated roof spoiler with LED brake light, as well as the rear park distance control with rear view camera. Now the comprehensive standard features continue on the inside. You've got electric windows all around, but I'll tell you what I would have liked is a one touch up and down, not just down feature. The uh, leather clad squared up steering wheel multifunction looks really good and you would have noticed it comes with cruise control as well. The entire range does, which is really great. And of course, very importantly, an eight inch infotainment system that comes with Bluetooth connectivity, voice recognition, and obviously with a USB in the front as well as in the rear and a 12 volt charger, it's very easy to pair your mobile device. It is good for Apple CarPlay as well as Android Auto. So all happy days there. But I'll tell you what I'm not happy about is actually how it's mounted. It's literally one big squared up block that's been shoved onto the dash, much like what Mercedes-Benz does. For me, I way prefer it when it's nicely integrated and becomes part of the dash design. 
What you're not gonna get is a very cool digital dash. This is very old school analog layout with its onboard computer as well. But the interior in general, as with all Kias these days, very, very well laid out. Not a lot of clutter, which I really appreciate. And even though there's a lot of hard plastics, which all the competitors have as well, it's good quality plastic and it's really well put together. The Koreans certainly do know how to fit out a car these days. What is really impressive is the space. My seat is in full driving position and look how much legroom I have. It's incredible and ample headroom as well. And in the rear for passengers with the USB, the air vents and this cool little drop down armrest with the cup holders, comfort is guaranteed. The boot though, 433 liters is class leading and uh, it's impressive considering that it's also got that full size spare. We took this car on the trip down to the low felt, three adults plus all of their luggage, food, refreshments for the group and the camera gear all fitting quite easily into the Seltos. The Seltos is also solid on safety because it comes standard with six airbags across the range as well as uh, Isofix child mounts. But the all important vehicle stability control system is only available if you spec EX Plus or the GT line. That I don't like. When I reviewed their range topping GT line with that 1.4 litre turbo petrol, I predicted then that this diesel when it arrives would be the pick of the bunch. I'm happy to tell you I can now confirm that is the case. This 1.5 litre VGT engine is sweet. It delivers 86 kilowatts, 250 newton meters, and it drives the front wheels either through a six-speed manual or six-speed automatic transmission. Now when I saw that we had the manual, I was a little bit worried. I mean, you know the peaky nature of a diesel engine, but the gearing is superb in the Seltos, as is the feel. It really is a good gearbox engine pairing, but I'd probably still recommend going for the auto transmission purely from a convenience point of view and the fuel consumption that is the real winner for me our 750 kilometer round trip included town driving obviously on the open road to the low felt car fully loaded and we're sitting on 5.3 liters per hundred i mean it is impossible to argue with that what was interesting though is that my passengers immediately commented on just how comfortable the entire experience was. Not only the ride quality, but also insulation of, uh, of the cabin. And it really is, the seats are comfortable. So hitting this on the open road in cruise control was an absolute breeze. It runs on a tweaked version of the Hyundai Creta. So you've got a pretty conventional suspension setup. It's got McPherson's in the front, and then at the rear they're running uh, a torsion beam. And it really does soak up the bumps really well. So it was super surprising when we actually went off the beaten track onto the gravel road and it literally felt like I was driving on rims. Um, I actually stopped, checked the tire pressures, recommended is 2.4. I actually dropped them to two bar. I felt an improvement through the steering, but the passengers at the rear said uh, things felt pretty much unchanged. Now I'm not an expert when it comes to suspensions, but it might just be tweaking uh, the rebound rates uh, and the actual dampers. But to be fair, it was a pretty rough road and that's not the natural habitat for the Seltos. Kia really do have all of their bases covered with their model lineup here in South Africa. The Seltos is offered with three engines, three transmissions, as well as three specification levels. And that coupled with their solid reputation and then backed up by what is an industry leading warranty. This is a vehicle you'd be foolish to overlook. The Seltos as a package is really solid and with that 100,000 Rand spread between the entry level and the top spec, they really are casting a very wide net. So the question is why do I not see more of them on the road? Well I think that's because the segment just offers so much to consumers. It is so broad and so loosely defined that consumers are not comparing apples with apples. Let's use a T-Cross as an example. When that came out it was an immediate sales success. So consumers are now price checking that versus the Seltos and going, it's a little bit pricey isn't it? Well that's because you're getting a lot more car for your money, literally because the Seltos is a way bigger car that should be compared against VW's T-Roc. Now when that arrives in November, it is gonna start 20,000 Rand more than the top spec Seltos, both of which are running with 1.4 liter turbo petrol engines. Kia is hoping to bring the Sonnet in December and that will then square up head to head against the T-Cross. 
When that happens, what I would do if I was them, I would ditch the 1.6 litre naturally aspirated engine and only offer the Seltos with the turbos, turbo petrol, turbo diesel, because the lower entry price point is now covered with the Sonnet. And there you have it. Apples with apples. Nachis with Nachis. Last year, I attended my very first DTM race at the Norris Ring as a guest of BMW South Africa to support local race ace Sheldon van der Linde, who was then in his rookie season. We caught up with him to reflect on 2020 and importantly look forward to the year ahead. Sheldon, we've, uh, we've got to chat and hang out in some pretty cool locations, but my office today I think is kick-ass sitting on the banks of a dam on a farm outside Hogsback. And where are you? Stuck in Germany. Yeah, first of all, I got to say your view over there looks really nice. I, I personally can't wait to get back to South Africa again. It's been a year since I've been there and since we last chatted. I remember the last time I was chatting was actually in Norris Ring for the, for the show we did. So uh, it's been a while, Morris, but it's good to catch up again. Uh, obviously, I'm in Germany now, as you can see, sitting in my simulator, uh, which is, we've even got the studio lights there if you look up top. So it's all very professional, the setup. Um, but yeah, it's, it's very cool to finally end the season now. It's been a long one, um, been very intense, uh, definitely my most intense season by far this year, um, which is always nice. It's nice to be busy. That's what I'm here for. I'm here to race as a professional race to be, to be what I am. So uh, yeah, just uh, living the dream at the moment. But I was just so stoked to see, you know, your first, your maiden victory in DTM as well. And in such tricky flipping conditions. Um, yeah, that's, that's a stoke. Because, I mean, in your rookie year, yeah, you'd gone qualified on pole. But to, to get onto the top step of the podium must have been a dream come true. Because I know you're super goal driven. So that would have definitely been a box that you would have wanted to have ticked. 100%. I think that was probably the biggest, obviously, achievement of my career and, and to this date. Um, it was very important for me to get that monkey off my back. Um, I think that's what also put so much pressure on me last year is that I always wanted that podium that went so badly. I just took a step back this year, said, listen, I know what to do now. I have the experience. I gained experience from last year. I have the speed with me. So I need to just put everything together now, make sure I don't make mistakes and then just let it come to me instead of trying to chase that goal um, and making mistakes, you know? So I think it worked out very well. This whole um, mindset that I had changed from 2019 to 2020 did me very well. And it just shows in the results as well that I was a lot more comfortable in my skin. Um, I knew what I was capable of. And in the end, we extracted some mega results. Uh, I had, I think, two podiums, one being second place, one being my, my maiden win in Assen, which is obviously very special to me. I mean, uh, just thinking back at that now, I already just get goosebumps of those radio calls over the line. And it just, I didn't have a voice left after that day because I was screaming so much. So. It's just incredible to see where my career has gone, and especially in this last year. It's one thing to sign a DTM contract, but it's that next to make that next step in your career. Uh, I really feel that I've done that, so I'm very, very proud of my season, to be honest. But what happens now for Sheldon? Because I sit there and I think, geez, like now with DTM, who knows what's happening there next year? Where does that leave you? Because this is your dream. Now it's uh, time to refocus and find something else to do. And obviously, BMW will be happy with what you've achieved. So where do you go to from here? Is there stuff lined up? Um, there's definitely something in the pipeline. Uh, I can definitely confirm that. And it will most probably be with BMW, which I'm very happy about because I like to be loyal to a brand. I think it's also very important from a driver's side to show that loyalty, um, to really stick with a brand and really reward them for all the trust that they've put in us. You know, So um, I'm personally looking forward to what's happening next year. I definitely uh, am aiming at something formally related, let's say. So that's always been my goal is to kind of move into electric now because I definitely think that is the future of motorsport and we need to kind of adapt with the times, you know, we need to be able to move and explore new things and not just be stuck in our way. I think that the future of combustion engines, unfortunately, as good as it is, yeah. as good as the sound is of the DTM car, as much horsepower as it is, um, it, it just, you have to move with the times and, and yeah, I mean, it's a, it's a great challenge now that I am willing to take on and hopefully I can secure myself a full-time seat within the next one or two years. That'll be my next goal now, I would say. How's that going to change mindset wise? Cause I mean, I know we joked during the off season. I mean, the only people that benefited with COVID were all the sim races and you were doing a lot of great, uh, great work on, on the simulators. I know BMW has got a pretty uh, Im impressive setup as well. How's that going to help you adjust if you do go the Formula E route from, you know, tin top racing, which is where you've spent your entire life. I mean, what are you 21 now? Long life. <laughs> and now move to, uh, to single seaters. 21. And yeah. 
Yeah, on open wheel racing, that's going to be pretty different. It's going to be very different. It's going to take a lot of adaption, like I said already. Um, the good thing is that we have a nice simulator in BMW where we can kind of, uh, we have a formal eSIM and we have a DTM SIM. Uh, they basically just change the platform from one to the next, which is quite nice for us to kind of get get in the groove of things, especially with me not having driven a Formula car before. It just helps with the kind of vision and the kind of view that you'll have in a Formula car with a halo in front of you and stuff like that, which I'm, I've never driven before. So um, it definitely, I have to say, nowadays it makes a driver's life a lot easier to adapt to these new cars and go into a test feeling a lot more prepared. Um, and in saying that, I actually have driven the, the Formula E car in a real test already, which is has been very exciting. I have to say it's something completely different. You hear the, the wind noise when you're driving and your helmet is moving around and it's, it's a completely different experience that I really enjoy. I've, for the last two years, I always somehow had my mind on formula cars. I always had the dream of kind of doing the F4, F3, F2 kind of thing, but it never really was within reach for us because as you know, coming from South Africa, it's hard to have the backing exactly from, uh, from the parents and so on. So um, it's nice now to kind of fulfill that let's say dream or goal that I always had of stepping into a formula car and uh, also being a professional racing driver now in a formula series is obviously the goal always. So it's very cool. Now let's talk, uh, let's talk South Africa. I mean, I know when I last year was such a big thing for South Africa to have international racing and the caliber of drivers like yourself uh, representing and, and obviously awesome for you to be racing internationally, but at home again with the Kailami nine hour, obviously that was also kind of up in the air with COVID, but the green light uh, and that, that's coming up in, uh, in a week's time. So that's uh, super exciting. You are obviously going to be there. Are you pairing up with the same, uh, same driver lineup as last year? The driver lineup is going to look very similar. So we've got Augusto Farfus on board again, obviously very experienced driver from Brazil, which I had on board with me last year as well. And then last year I had uh, Martin Tomczyk, uh, which will be replaced by Nicky Katzberg this year. Also very popular, one of the, the best, let's say, within BMW internally. So personally, I think it's probably the strongest lineup uh, that we've had, at least I've had in a GT3 car in the last couple of years. So very much looking forward to that. Um, hopefully the rain doesn't come bucketing down again. Last year it was quite a quite a hefty one with all the rain coming down. And obviously for the M6, it's not so easy with, with traction and so on. And the car's naturally very big. So we kind of struggled to to put all that power down. But um, hopefully it's going to be dry this year, this time around. But uh, with South Africa and this time of the year, you never really know what it's going to do. Normally it rains quite a lot anyway because it's so hot. So, uh, I mean, fingers crossed that it stays dry. But if it stays wet, we'll, we'll take on the challenge for sure. Um, before we go, just, I mean, it must be crap to get on a podium and then no flipping spectators. I mean, I just thought of you with DTM and are you talking about, yeah, to be on the podium and again, no spectators at Kyle Army nine hour. That must be like the champagne must taste a bit crap. Yeah. I mean, to be honest, champagne never really tastes shit, to be honest, excuse my language, but, um, <laughs> I'll be happily taking it along, you know, when the, if the opportunity does arise, but like you said, it's never really the same, not having the fans there. I remember last year, there's so many people coming up to me and asking for autographs, asking for little chats. And I'm always open to that, you know, because I know where my roots are and I know where I come from. And I know that these people have been supporting me since the, the first step in my career. And therefore, I'm always very thankful to, to my South African supporters. I have a lot of them as well back home. So it's going to be very uh, disappointing. I think my parents probably won't even be able to be at the track as well, which is kind of a weird uh, thing you know they'll probably be sitting at home watching on tv even though they're only 15 minutes away from the racetrack Sheldon just um yeah th thank you again and and like what you said about you know giving back to your fans and it was cool to interact with them last year and and you do you know exactly where your roots are and and tracking your journey has been a really exciting thing for me just to watch the maturity and the professionalism with which you've tackled everything you've done i love talking to you because you just yeah you're so good with good with your time but i appreciate it <laughs> thank you thank you very much morris always an honor chatting to you again and uh hopefully like i said we see each other in kailami for a little catch up again and uh, all the best on your on your lovely view there in the background and uh yeah we catch up soon Good. Yeah, hopefully I'll be sipping champagne with you on the podium this year. I'll be there, so that'll be awesome. Just make sure you're there on the podium. <laughs> okay. Cool. Thanks, Sheldon. Uh, it's always good fun catching up with Sheldon and obviously wishing him all the best for 2021. So excited, though, because next weekend is Kyle Lamy 9 Hour, the best GT racing drivers in the world right here in South Africa. But that is our first lap done and dusted. Would love to have your thoughts on what you thought of Motor Driven. But you're probably wondering what is coming up next week on our show. 
Let me show you. Come have a look. On Motor Driven next week, VW complete their SUV lineup with the T-Roc which was launched last week. We take a quick look. It's a classic case of rebadging as Toyota introduces the Starlet to the South African market. And we try and make head or tail of Arto and the regulations.